if you think about what can you do good is to prevent epilepsy uh, at all and then um, to prevent secondary epileptogenesis or to prevent progression of the disease. So epileptogenesis, rather grand sounding, refers to the origin, the primary cause of an epilepsy. And it can be said that we need to understand a person's individual epileptogenesis in order to prevent seizure onset. Well, today we have star neurologist and psychiatrist Eugen Trinker of Austria tell us about his cool study over lockdown into epileptogenesis in people who have had a stroke. Yes, my name is Eugen Trinker and I'm chair of the Department for Neurology and Neurointensive Care at the Paracelsus Medical University Salzburg. Uh, and I love to be an epileptologist. It's a very interesting field and very gratifying uh, to treat patients. Okay, and I've just had an epilepsy brain moment. What, we're not doing status. What are we doing? Epileptogenesis. <laughs> Maybe keep that bit in because this is what happens for people with epilepsy all the time. So um, could you tell us a bit about your work, please, in um, epileptogenesis? Actually, tell us what what defines that, because a lot of people aren't familiar with it. Um, Epileptogenesis refers to uh, a process. It's a development uh, of tissue uh, capable of generating spontaneous seizures, resulting in the development of generating an epileptic condition in the brain, which is usually progressive once epilepsy is established. So that's the usual definition. So it's about the generation of uh, uh, tissue, which is able to uh, generate seizures. And um, what does it mean? So you have a disturbance in the brain, for example, an acquired brain trauma or a stroke, or um, a vascular uh, malformation, which um, has an influence on the tissue, on the brain tissue around, which makes the brain tissue around that lesion capable of generating seizures. So if you think about um, so-called genetic epilepsies, it's rather difficult because there's an um, inborn uh, error or a gene defect, which, uh, has an influence on the brain, brain development, and then renders the brain epileptic. So the main issue is that you don't start with a seizure. You start with a lesion or a disturbance of the brain, which then generates the first seizure, and then maybe generates the second seizure. So the first from the insult to the first seizure is called primary epileptogenesis. And from the first seizure to the next and next and next is called secondary epileptogenesis. If you think about what can you do good is to prevent epilepsy uh, at all and then um, to prevent secondary epileptogenesis or to prevent progression of the disease. So that's the major principle. What we do in in the clinical field is the following. First, In animal experiments, there are a lot of excellent substances, anti-seizure medicines, which work, which are anti-epileptogenic, which can prevent epilepsy. But in the clinical arena, it's very difficult. In the clinical field, all the trials have failed so far. So what we have to ask ourselves is first, can we extrapolate the findings from the animals to the humans? Can we use the same drugs as we use it for the animals in the humans? Or are we completely on the wrong track? <laughs> and we should, simply, uh, we should simply look at different things. Um, to make a clinical trial is extremely difficult. And expensive. <laughs> and expensive. So exactly. Sorry, what you said is true. You need a a sponsor to finance the trial, and that's a few million euros, which you need for a clinical trial. If it's done at the cheapest level in a purely academic setting. So that's what we, what we tried to do. We made a, a, it's not a proof of principle. It's more, it's a trial in preventing post-stroke epilepsy. And at what stage are we? 
Well, we are at the stage that we recruited all the patients and we started uh, to treat them with an anti-epileptogenic substance, mm -hmm. which is lycabazepine acetate. And, um, and then we are going to observe all of the patients and we included 100, around 150 patients um, until one year after the brain insult. And we expect that the initial therapy we gave them uh, should prevent uh, the occurrence of spontaneous seizure after a stroke. Amazing. Yeah, the difficulty is uh, to recruit in stroke units patients. The second difficulty is to recruit patients during COVID pandemic time where- <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah. These were closed. Um, but we managed to do it and the, the trial is now, um, the, the, the concept of the trial and the recruitment of the trial is published now in Epilepsy Open. And we're going to await, it's still blinded. We observe the patient, it's still blinded. And um, in about, um, well, let's say at the end of the year, we expect the first results. How did you identify these patients having had the primary stages of epileptogenesis a bit before they'd had their first seizure? How did you do that? That's a good question. But what you see that if you have a stroke, you have a high risk of having a seizure after that. Of course. Okay. Yeah. With a stroke have a low risk and some people with certain other types of stroke have a high risk. So we selected those with the highest risk. These are stroke in the anterior circulation, not in the area, in the anterior circulation. Right. Stroke with cortical involvement mm -hmm. and some other factors about stroke severity and um, those who had an acute symptomatic seizure initially when they presented as a stroke. So all these factors, they have a very high risk for a relapse. It's around 40% uh, uh, spontaneous risk of having seizures. So if you assume that you can reduce the risk by 50%, you can get a, a, a reduction of uh, epilepsy and you can deal with the low number of patients, around 200 to 300 patients, which you need according to our calculations. So based on the fact that we had COVID and we had some recruitment problems, we only have uh, uh, 120 patients so far uh, included, but we have additional biomarkers, we have EEG, uh, we have the imaging results in all the patients, and we think that we can uh, at least show something which is important for the future to prevent post-stroke epilepsy. I know somebody um, who had a stroke um, and recently has um, passed away, but after his seizure, uh, sorry, after his stroke, yes, he did develop epilepsy. He didn't just have one seizure he was and then he was put onto lamotrigine and just taking that basically for the rest of his life um now obviously i'm not that person but i if i was to put myself in his position i would totally be up for just trying this because you just never know right and of course it will benefit people other people long term yes yes and you 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 see the burden of uh, post-stroke epilepsy is uh, is really high because it's associated with post-stroke cognitive decline has a right. high for dementia if you have a stroke with a seizure. Uh, secondly, it is more often associated with stroke and depression when you have a seizure and the it's an independent risk factor for a poor functional outcome. So it has on all levels which you look at, it has a poor prognosis. So to um, prevent epilepsy in any case, I think would improve uh, prognosis after a stroke uh, in terms of cognition, depression, uh, and uh, also functional outcomes. So I think these factors are linked together. And so in the study, this particular um, drug or this compound, did it 
um, have any negative side effects, side effects, like for instance, upon a person's mood or anything like that? No, not yet, because it was only short term treatment. It's only four weeks of treatment, which you give in the acute phase. Yeah. And uh, so the compound which we used was effective in preventing seizures in the animal, as we as said previously. And of course, it has all the safety data which you have uh, to have for a trial in the uh, humans. It's a licensed drug which we used for a different purpose. And the name is Aslicabazepin acetate, which you may know mm -hmm. because it's also used as an anti-seizure medicine. Uh, but um, as, as you showed that they act also on a calcium channel in the brain, which is overexpressed in acute stroke, in acute uh, brain lesions. So this is why we think that it might have an influence on the epileptogenesis in these patients. This is amazing. Okay, but the people who have had stroke, did they tend to be sort of older, like 65 plus, or were they younger people as well? Well, the, um, the general age of stroke is between 60 and 75, and then it, it has a plateau, and then it decreases. So the majority were elderly, so-called, 65 plus, which have a different tolerability of the drugs, which are uh, very often cognitively impaired already when they have their first stroke. So it's very important to use a, a drug which can be tolerated. Mm -hmm. And also think about renal function. The kidney loses its ability to eliminate the drug. So the renal function goes down. So you have to have different doses, uh, the, the lower one for those with renal impairment. It's Great to have you speaking about people who are older, because a lot of the time the studies can be done on people who might be younger and a bit cuter. Um, but this, as well as showing the potential impact of this compound, this drug, also, um, I think is a, it brings to hopefully our listeners' attention that we do have people who are older with an epilepsy and they need help as well. And the fact that it is, you know, distinctly... Uh, well, correlated slash cause, causated by a stroke as well, I think shows that we need perhaps people in the sphere of the strokes to be a little more interested potentially in the epilepsy. I absolutely agree because this was um, a major hurdle uh, to perform the study in, in certain centers where the stroke people are there and the epilepsy people are there. We need to work in, in one department uh, in, in, in one unit and have a very close connection. So there was a, a, a doctor scientist from Portugal, uh, Carla Bentes. Uh, she received the uh, European um, uh, Young uh, Epilepsy Award several years ago. And she looked carefully at people in the stroke units, did daily EEG, did a video EEG for uh, 24 hours, etc., and found that up to 25% of patients have seizures. No way, wow. In the first half of the stroke. So in the previous assumption where that it is around 5% or so, because the seizures were simply overlooked. In the elderly population, especially in stroke, many, many seizures are non-convulsive. So you have to look closely. And stroke persons are more interested in functional deficits, which are not fluctuating. So this is a different way to look at the thing. And um, I think this was a very important study by Carla Bentes. She was also one of the centers recruiting, uh, but um, others where there was no connection to the stroke people, they could not recruit appropriately. Well, it's a perfect example, like you're just saying, of there should be more interaction between parties. And if people would like to, well, obviously we can check you out on ResearchGate, but if anybody, any clinicians, for example, or researchers would be interested in taking part or working with you further in this, would, how should they connect with you? First of all, if, if they see me somewhere at the conferences, I think the best way is to approach personally. Uh, number mm -hmm. two, uh, I'm on the social media. Uh, so you can contact me there and many people do 
uh, via Facebook or, uh, or LinkedIn. Um, my email address can be found there and you can contact me directly at the Department uh, for Neurology at the Paracelsus Medical University in Salzburg and I will be happy to connect with you. Thank you so very much. It's been really exciting and uh, we could natter on for ages. But thank you for your time. Thank you so much and uh, hope to see you soon again. Thank you so much to Eugen for his valuable insight into epileptogenesis and stroke. This is truly exciting stuff. So do check out the paper. The link is on the website.